All right. Well, this is uh, number four uh, this week. We've seen pictures of heaven. The two dominant pictures in the Bible are heaven as a city, heaven as a garden. We then looked at uh, what was next? The invitation or access or welcome to heaven. And we, we have access there, Paul says in Romans 5, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we looked at our need, our need of access. There's a problem with us, our sinfulness. There's a problem with God, His wrath. Then we looked at two aspects of the work of Christ. Christ as victor, Christ as redeemer. Yesterday, uh, the contrast, the picture of hell. And now today, the hope of heaven. And we'll be looking at Revelation 21, 1 to 6, and 22, 1 to 5. It's the same vision, but just uh, those two portions of it. So we'll look at the need, the character, and the reception of hope. Okay? All right. Well, we'll be looking at uh, the book of Revelation. It's just a weird book. Uh, the way it's handled by popular uh, series in our day, it's like a theological crossword puzzle that you're to figure it out if you have this magic code somehow. And we completely lose the idea that it was written to real people by a real person. All of them had real needs. So we'll be trying to consider these passages in the light of that. Okay? Um, just quickly, the book of Revelation is a piece of apocalyptic literature. Okay? Uh, you don't read The Cat and the Hat by Dr. Seuss the same way you would read The Brothers Karamazov, would you? They're books. <laughs> would you read them the same way? No, they're different types of literature. Apocalyptic literature has a number of characteristics just very quickly. It has a figurative use of language. Okay? You don't take everything strictly literal. Alright? It has uh, portrays the frightening power of evil. There are monsters. There are fire-breathing dragons. That uh, There's a scene in which a woman is giving birth and there's a fire-breathing dragon waiting to eat the baby as soon as he's born. Uh, you have a special attention to angels. I mean, they're flying everywhere. They're the protectors of God's people. They're messengers from God. Lots of angels. But the fundamental theme of all apocalyptic literature is the kingship of God. This type of literature is usually written in the context of persecution. And so the theme of hope is dominant but it's especially coming from the fact that God is king. Okay? If you're reading a book where the dominant theme is kingship, what are some of the words or pictures you would expect to see? A throne. A throne, very good, yeah. Crown. Crowns, sure. Yeah that sort of scepters or people coming to serve the king or someone enthroned. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay. Well, let's read these passages and uh, jump right in. Uh, chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. Uh, John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Could that be a figurative use of language? <laughs> you have a city descending from heaven and it looks like a bride coming to a wedding. And behold, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be His people. And God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, 
and the former things have passed away. And he who is seated, where? On the throne, said, Behold, I am making all things new. Uh, so forth, so on. Uh, verse 6, To the thirsty I will give of the spring of the water of life without payment. Alright, so that's weird. Uh, right off the bat, we have uh, a city coming, a new city coming down. Looks like a bride going to a wedding. Alright, then uh, chapter 22, this is part of that same vision. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, His name will be on their foreheads, night shall be no more, they shall have no need of light, of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Okay, well that's weird. Again, a city coming down, like it's going to a wedding. You have a throne and a river flowing from it figurative use of language, but notice the fundamental theme of apocalyptic literature, the kingship of God. You have the throne of God mentioned about five times in just those few verses. That's the dominant theme. Okay? Now, let's look at this. The need we have and that original audience had for hope. The entire book of Revelation shows us that we need that. A living hope. Uh, It's, again, the book is so weird, we tend to forget basic things like this. Um, But it is not a theological crossword puzzle. Okay? And sadly, uh, the popular series Left Behind has little to do with the book. It's uh, in the history of interpretation. The Left Behind series is a minority opinion. Certainly not the dominant opinion in our day uh, in actual studies of the book. Uh, Well, who is this audience to whom John is writing and for whom these visions were given? Chapter 21, verse 4, apparently they were people who were dealing with mourning and crying and pain, who were tearful and were facing death. They needed a living hope. They needed that. Um, Get this. You can handle your present circumstances, whatever they are, only in terms of what you believe the future prospects are. Okay? However difficult the present may be, you can handle that, humanly speaking, by what you think the future holds. All right? Uh, I'll give you a couple of illustrations here. Uh, During summers when I was in high school and college, I worked at a large manufacturing plant on the Tennessee River in Decatur, Alabama. It was Wolverine Tube. We made copper tubing. A couple thousand men shift work. I worked third shift. They had a policy uh, where during summers and uh, holidays, they would hire the sons of their permanent employees. My dad had worked there for years. Hey, I was a college boy, and so I got to work. But they always put you on the worst jobs and the worst shifts, third shift. I would work from midnight till 8 in the morning, six days a week. And I did that through college, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all that. Uh, When you go in there, most of those men with that were employed there at the time barely had a high school education. Okay? And uh, you had to wear uh, these cotton coveralls because you would be so filthy by the time your uh, shift was over. A lot of uh, overhead cranes, dangerous job, heavy machinery, a lot of fire where I was. Had to wear asbestos gloves. Mm, Can you imagine? And... uh, but I remember the men would always check you out every summer. 
even the last summer I worked there, they wanted to check on you. And so they would do things like uh, your coveralls were loosely fitting, and so they would drop lit cigarettes in your back pocket. And it was just a matter of time before it burned through to your skin. Now, it was a big joke. All They all knew what was going on, but they were waiting to see how you would respond. If you got mad, you'd had it. Because they would pick on you unmercifully the rest of the time you were there. But, if you laughed along with them, I mean, you're hopping and trying to you know, fan the flames and put them out before your rear end gets burned. Uh, if you played along with them, they thought, well, he's one of us. And you were one of the guys. And that was just every summer. Um, it was hard work, dirty work. I lived with my grandmother at the time, and she, I was so nasty when I would come home at 8 in the morning. She would make me take my coveralls off on the back porch, and she would immediately wash them. She would not let me come into the house because I was so dirty. <laughs> there was no time, there was no social life. I mean, you're just dog tired. It was a good time for saving money, and that's about all. I made $2.75 an hour for the first 40 hours. And that sixth day, overtime, I made $3.10. <laughs> that was hard work. But I knew that by the end of the summer, I had at the time this ton of cash. It would pay for a year and a half of school. I could earn that much money with this hard work. And I, so that that future hope of having that ton of cash kept me going during the summer. Six week, six uh, days a week, third shift the conditions of work, all of that, okay? The prospect of the future helped me deal with the present. See that connection? That's pretty easy. It was the same for the people to whom John was writing. Let me tell you another story. Um, there was a lady, a noble woman, Mary, uh, had just given birth. She was a nursing mother. Her father was wealthy and... Uh, was politically connected. They lived in North Africa, in Carthage, which was a major city uh, in, uh, I think it's modern day Tunisia now. But uh, Carthage was a large city with a uh, Colosseum, and uh, they were persecuting Christians. And this young woman, she was, I think she was 22 years old, Perpetua, and her slave girl maid, Felicity, uh, Felicity who was pregnant, were both arrested at a Bible study, thrown in prison to be executed for the entertainment of the inhabitants of Carthage. Okay. Uh, Perpetua's dad came to her pleading with her, give up this silliness. All you have to do is offer a sacrifice for the welfare of the emperor. That's all you have to do. And she said, no, that's worshiping Him as God. I'm a Christian. I will not do that. She was trying to care for her baby in prison. Uh, the governor of Carthage had her father beaten in front of her to try to get her to change her mind. Uh, Felicity, who was expecting, was afraid that she could not be executed with perpetual because she was pregnant. So they began to pray that Felicity would give birth in prison so that she could be executed with Perpetua. They came and they're sent out to the Colosseum. They are separated men and women. Uh, a wild cow was turned loose on the women. There were others involved. And uh, there was a wild boar, a bear, and a leopard that was turned loose on the men. And uh, of course the cheer, you know, the crowds loved it, this blood fest. 
uh, one of their best friends who was arrested in the Bible study, Saturus, uh, had a, a large wound where the leper basically tore his shoulder off. And they were bathed in blood by the time it was over. And so the crowd began to mock them in terms of Christian baptism. Ah, now you are well washed, they said. They were not washed in the waters of baptism, Christian baptism, but washed in their own blood. Uh, The women were uh, stripped and given robes of cultic priestesses, again, mocking them uh, in their death. The time came finally for them to be put to death. The wild cow uh, who had trampled them was unable to kill them. And so they called one of the gladiators out there and he was going to slit their throats. But he was a newbie, a young man who hadn't done this before. He was ordered to kill the women and he had trouble doing it. Perpetua held his hand to her throat and helped him slice her throat open. So my question, and we could multiply these stories in the early church. How do you do that? How do you live through that? How do you maintain the courage when you know what is about to happen? It's this, y'all. It's this. And the stories could be told by the thousands of the early Christians. Uh, What were these people facing? John's audience and the early centuries until Christianity was legitimized in the Roman Empire, there was intense, systematic, relentless persecution, often on a widespread emperor uh, empire-wide scale. Sometimes it was just localized like it was at Carthage with Perpetua. Um, But John spoke to them, wrote to them in terms of a living hope. They could bear up under their present circumstances however hard because of their future prospects that were certain. New heavens, a new earth a paradise of delights, a city garden where everything was new. That future hope gave them courage in present circumstances. Okay? Uh, And you know what? The testimony of history, even non-Christian historians say, it worked. It worked. Uh, the Christians sang when they were being burned at the stake. Sang. Uh, Nero, who was a uh, Nero, was a homosexual emperor, had little naked boys running around his court in Rome. He ruled during the 60s A.D. and uh, he blamed the Christians for burning Rome. And so what he decided to do was burn them. And he would dip them in pitch and lash them to the top of a pole in his gardens, set them on fire. So they could be like torches at night while he entertained his guests. Uh, And the Christians sang. They uh, prayed for their tormentors when they were thrown to lions. When plagues would hit Roman cities, uh, people would run for their lives, get out of there. These dreadful plagues that kill people by the hundreds and by thousands. Guess who stayed to care for the dying? The Christians. The Christians stayed. How could they do that? They had hope. They knew what was ahead for them when they died. Okay? So, what are you facing? What's it like when you go home? Do you have a living hope? It is found in Christ. Alright? Any questions before we move on?
the other two points won't be as long. That was just a little longer. Okay. Uh, let's see. The character of this hope. Uh, <clears throat> And we'll look at the passage here. Remember the characteristics of apocalyptic literature and guess from where uh, this vision is rooted in the throne. Notice chapter 21, verse 3. Behold, I heard a loud voice from the throne. Uh, Verse 5 of the same chapter. He who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new, so forth. Chapter 22, verses 1 and 3. Uh, we have this river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from where? What's the source of it? The throne of God. And then verse 5, um, again, about... Uh, no, that, verse 3, sorry. Uh, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. Who's in charge of all this? Who's in charge of the world? Were Roman emperors? Were there harsh, powerful legions? No. The God to whom these Christians belonged. The King of the universe. He was the one. And this hope, the character of this hope, is that first of all, it is rooted in the kingship of God rooted in the kingship of God. God is not wringing His hands saying, Oh, what am I going to do? No. Kings don't act that way. They have everything planned. They're in charge. Okay? As bleak as circumstances may look in our lives, still there's hope. There may be hope for the Christian. Because our Heavenly Father is in charge. Uh, Notice that uh, it's uh, rooted in the kingship of God and what comes from that is life. Life. We have this river flowing from the throne of God. This river of life. Um, A consequence of God ruling is that life is given to those who entrust themselves to Him. Um, You know, the city here possesses the characteristics of an earthly paradise. Lush vegetation on both sides of this river of life. You have the tree of life. It it just doesn't bear fruit once a year. It bears fruit 12 times a year. There's healing in the leaves of that tree, so forth and so on. Uh, And again, we have that city-garden image coming together here at the end of the Bible. In Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, there's a scene in which you know they're looking for this promised future king, but no one knows what he looks like. How will we be able to detect him, to identify him? And this old woman who uh, knows makes this remark. She says, here's how we can tell this promised future king The hands of that king are healing hands. Thus shall the rightful king be known. It's quite in keeping with the biblical picture of healing and kingship in the uh, book of Revelation. Uh, The effects of the river here, this river flowing from the throne of God, is uh, for healing. Again, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier in the week, the word healing there, we get our English word therapy, therapist. Um, It's very broad. It's not just psychological counseling, but wholeness, restoration of soul and body. Um, And it's symbolic here of uh, abundant life, the reversal of the fall. There's restored wholeness that we get Uh, internally, psychologically, physically. Um, With God, there's restoration with God. It's like a marriage scene. Uh, The new Jerusalem is coming down adorned as a bride ready for her wedding. Uh, uh, It's pictured as a city. God puts us in community 
that we may be whole. God puts us in families. God puts us in a church. God puts us in marriages. We're not made to be isolated at home. Though sometimes community is frightening to us, so there's rejection and we pull away. Okay, we deal with the consequences of that. But in heaven, we'll be in a city. We're not living at the end of some dirt road in Montana you know, by ourselves. We're put in community. Um, the here, the pain and tears will be replaced by healing and compassion. Insecurity or wounds will be replaced with security and intimacy and so forth. That's the character of this hope. Any questions? Okay. All right, well, let's look at how we get it. The reception of this hope. Who gets this hope, according to John? Well, uh, you know, when we look at the description of those who are kept out of the city, we think we know. Listen to this. Chapter 21, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then verse 27 of chapter 21. But nothing unclean will ever enter the city, nor anyone who uh, does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, remember we're asking who gets this hope? Well, it seems to be pretty clear so far, we think. Then in chapter 22 and verse 15, outside of the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Okay, you read those lists and we think, aha, I know how to get this hope. I need to quit doing that. I don't need to practice or act in that way. Do you think we can save ourselves simply by cleaning up our lives? Would you agree? That that would seem to be the picture here. Uh, However, that's not the answer that's given. In chapter 21, verse 6, God speaking from the throne says, uh, To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. (laughs) Who gets this hope? Who receives this hope? The thirsty. The thirsty do. Think of the imagery of water that even Jesus uses. The woman at the well, you know, she was hardly uh, sexually upright. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. On another occasion, Jesus said, if any man is thirsty, what? Here's a great invitation. If anyone is thirsty, what do you do? Jesus says, Come to me and drink. Who are those, according to the Bible, that receive this hope that is rooted in the kingship of God, involves restoration and wholeness, is a future prospect that can help us bear up any under any present circumstances? Who gets it? The thirsty. Thirsty? Are you thirsty? God the King is a God who delights in people being thirsty and loves to give life. 
y'all, Christianity is not about information. It's about relationship with the living God. He makes us sons and daughters with full right to inheritance of the new heavens and the new earth. And He gives it to all who are thirsty. All right. Any questions, comments? Yeah. I mean, one of the, the write-up for this class kind of asked, what, what you know, what happens when we die? Could, could you speak briefly about, I guess, the, like the heaven of death versus the heaven of the resurrection? You know? okay. What happens when we die versus eternity? Yeah. All right. Um, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for the Christian. There's no lag time. The instant a Christian dies, he, his spirit immediately goes to the presence of God, his Father, while his body rests in the grave until the final resurrection, which will take place at Jesus' return. We were talking about it on Tuesday. You said just now, like, as soon as you die, you go to heaven, but you don't believe that the little kid that said heaven is for real, you, you didn't believe that. So, like, he died, he came back. So you don't think he went to heaven? <coughs> Two minutes or whatever? Uh, he may have... I, I think what uh, irritates me so much about these so-called best-selling books is that often they have little to do with the Bible, but Christian people know more about those books than they do about what the Bible says yeah, about them. Now, he may have, and, you know, I, it's just kind of uh, his experience. It, it is interesting that uh, Lifeway bookstores, they're... Christian bookstores all over the place uh, owned by the Southern Baptist Convention yank those books off the shelves. They don't sell them anymore because of this uh, this young man recanting his story and saying it was not true. I don't know if this is true. I don't know where I heard this. But is it somewhere in the Bible that says that the spirit lurks around the body for like three days or something like that and that's why in the big case it says that you shouldn't touch the body for like three days or something until yeah I, I don't know that that's a Christian teaching alright yeah. <laughs> yeah since a day in eternity can be a thousand years when you die are you immediately taking taken to the end because to me, it just doesn't really make sense if you live in eternity for you to have to wait for everyone to get there. It seems that eternity begins when the new heavens and new earth are brought together. I'm just wondering if okay. it's kind of like we go there immediately since eternity is completely relative. Yeah, okay. Well, I think it's Peter that uses that language of uh, in the eyes of the Lord that one day is as a thousand years, that sort of thing. But uh, God does have a timetable. He has created history. He works within history and time. And uh, He has a date set for the return of His Son. And uh, so there is an intermediate state for Christians. Our spirits go to His presence. And we wait for Him to say, all right, it's over. And we're, our spirits will be reunited with our new bodies, resurrection bodies. So I guess then you could say, time shall be no more at that point. All right. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Well, thanks for your attention. Thanks for your questions. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do ask that you will give to us a clear glimpse of hope. And uh, I pray for uh, these, my friends, that you would give to them uh, such a vibrant living hope of the future that it would sustain them in their present circumstances. 
In Christ we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks.